And uh, today we're going to be in the the book of Romans, chapters uh, 1 through 5, and quite honestly, we could spend a long time here. And uh, next Sunday, we will probably still be in Romans chapter 5. It's it's a wonderful chapter of the Bible, one of my favorites. Uh, But Paul begins, and, uh, and, and we're speaking about faith, peace, and hope. And here's what Paul says. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we've obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we uh, rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Well, let's bow for prayer. Well, Father, as we come in Jesus' name, Father, I, I just have to admit today I, I'm, um, I'm at a loss on uh, what to say about this passage of Scripture because it's so rich. But, Father, I just simply want to praise you today, Father, because we are justified by faith through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not in anything I could ever do. I could never be that good. But, Father, Christ was better than good. He was the perfect Son of God. Uh, the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world because he was pure and he was spotless. And we thank you for his love. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the first thing I I want to call to your attention is it it speaks about us being justified by faith. And to me, that doctrine of justification is really just simply stated, just as though I'd never sinned. When God looks at me today, he doesn't see me as a rascal, even though I am sometimes. Uh, God does not, does, does not see me as a, as a vile sinner because he sees me through the lens and the covering of the blood, uh, blood of Jesus Christ. And because of what Christ did on the cross, I am justified in God's sight. Now, I'm still in a sinful body, but God sees me as I'm justified. And when I sin, I don't lose my salvation. I break my, my line of fellowship with God, and I have to go back to him and ask forgiveness for that sin. I'm still one of his children. Now, people say, well, that gives you a license to sin. Well, let me tell you, if you find pleasure in a habitual lifestyle of sin, you're probably not a Christian because that is contrary to what the Bible says because once we become a Christian, our lives should change dramatically. We should not be, be content and with the desires of the flesh And if we stray, we should be convicted by the Holy Spirit that we're in the wrong. You know, sometimes I pray about things and I pray about things and and, uh, and I'm not getting the answer from God that I want because it's not what God wants for me. You know what I mean? And, And so if, and God is keeping me from going that direction through the Holy Spirit who is working within me. But we've been justified by faith. Justification is a one-time legal declaration with continuing continuing results through the righteousness of Christ that when I place my faith in him has been appropriated to me and, and it is to anybody who believes Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And we're justified through Jesus Christ. And he says, by faith. Faith is believing God and acting upon that belief. Now, our emphasis will either be on the acting or the believing. Now, let me read it again. Faith is believing God and acting upon that belief. If our emphasis is on the acting, then we're being faithful in the doing, but the believing is taking God at his word. And my actions ought to be based upon taking God at his word. You know, we mentioned Haiti a moment ago. They told our embassy to vacate the premises and get out. And several months back, they warned the missionaries that they ought to leave Haiti. Now, Jan Thompson chose to stay. And she says, it's not because I'm brave. It's not because I'm courageous, but it's because I'm where I believe God wants me to be. And so she's acting on the faith that she has in God and on the principles of God's word, and she's taking God at his word. You know, I'm, I marvel at our missionaries, you know, and, and, uh, and the faith that they have and what it costs them sometimes uh, to try to do the will of God and to, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I got a letter this week. Well, it, was a, it was, wasn't really much of a letter. It was more a, a plea for money. And... Uh, uh, 
as is most of our mail this time of year, because if it's not, not a Christian organization, it's some political organization. But it's open door. And they've got a ministry that goes into North Korea, not bodily because they'd be killed or put into prison, but they're getting in by mail that they're sneaking in and they're getting in by radio broadcasts. And uh, because if you are a Christian in North Korea, you will spend your, the, le- the, the rest of your life in a prison if you don't die. And, and so they, they were asking for money to try to get it in and, and to, to try to see these people uh, come to Christ uh, being justified by faith. But faith is taking God at his word and acting upon it. And when you read Hebrews 11, it's a chapter full of illustrations of people who pleased God because they were people of faith. But we have been justified by faith. And what that means is we need to take God at his word. And in the matter of salvation, it's what's called the Roman road. For all of sin to come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we need to take God at his word and believe that that is the way of salvation through Jesus Christ. No other way except what God says. And then one of my favorite passages, Romans 5 verses 8 through 10, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The pure, unblemished Son of God was willing to die for us while we were still sinners. And Paul goes on to say, since we have now been justified, how? By his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? That is what we need to act upon is that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, in Romans 5, the verses I read, verses 1 through 5, Paul is giving us a list of the blessings of justification. And one of those is peace with God. He said we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we were justified by faith through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we are justified, then we have peace peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace with God is different than the peace of God. Peace with God means that we're no longer at war with God, you know, because we are sinners and he is righteous. The peace of God comes from being a Christian and being faithful in your daily walk, having a Bible, a time you read your Bible and a time that you pray and you can draw closer to God. Now, the implication is this. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and the implication is at one point in our life, we we were at odds with God. You see, we are born with a sin nature in need of redemption. Now, I preached a sermon uh, yesterday at a funeral for a, a little baby that died one month old. And I reassured the family that that baby was in heaven. Because that baby did not have the ability to reckon for, for uh, you know, any concept of sin. I mean, it was an infant. So that baby did not need to be saved because the baby was safe until it became accountable and could reason right and wrong and needed to be saved. But we, we as adults, we are at odds with God until we come to him to know him as our Lord and Savior. When Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, verses 12 through 13, he said, at that time, speaking to the Gentiles, anybody that was not a Jew, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And that is our hope that when we were without Christ, Christ died for us that he could bring us within the fold of the Lord uh, himself. Augustine once said, you made us for yourself and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. <clears throat> you know, I was, uh, I did a funeral a couple of months back of, uh, ago of a young man that died of fentanyl. <clears throat> and I used this verse at that service. 
I said, you know, we go through our lives trying to find a sense of satisfaction and completeness and fulfillment in everything that the world has to offer, and it simply is not there. It's only in Jesus Christ. Well, that is something that's just so true. There is nothing that this world can give us that will fulfill us in completeness, that emptiness you see, we were, we were hardwired for eternity when God created mankind. But Adam and Eve sinned, and that fellowship with God was broken, and, and so we're trying to reconnect with God in everything that we can find possible, in every way we can imagine, except simply admitting we're sinners and turning to Jesus Christ for salvation. Paul also spoke about access to God. <clears throat> He said, access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Now, the word for access is prosgogi, and it, and it means the right to enter and the freedom to enter. Now, sometimes you can have a pass that you, you wear around your neck when you're at some seminar, and that guarantees you entrance because you've got this card with your name and your ID on it, and you're allowed to enter into the facility. Well, it's... Our access is because of Jesus, and we have the right to enter because of him. And because of our relationship with him, uh, Paul says that we were justified by the death of Christ and we're no longer strangers, we're heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That's Romans 8, 17. Now the word for access, that Greek word, is only found three places in the New Testament. It's found where I just read it in Romans 5, 2. It's found in Ephesians 2, 18. And it's found in Ephesians 3, 12. Let me read that for you. In whom we have boldness, in Jesus Christ, we have boldness and confident access to God by way of Christ's faithfulness. My access, again, is not dependent upon how good I am, but it's dependent upon what Jesus Christ did for me, and I'm now justified in the eyes of God, and he recognizes me as a son and gives me entry by way of prayer when I go to him. Now, Paul also spoke about the grace in which we stand. Now, when we think about grace, <clears throat> generally we think about Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's very good, because that, that, is, that is the grace that opens everything else up to us in regard to grace. But when we think about grace, we also need to think about it in the context of 2 Peter 3.18, where we're told to grow in the grace of God. And then we need to think about it in the context of 2 Corinthians 12.9, and it's the grace that will sustain us in our trials. And then in Hebrews 4.16, because there's a grace to help us in the present time of our need, and we're told to come boldly under the throne of grace to obtain it. Now, into this grace in which we stand. Now, Paul had a certain preacher boy that he was very fond of. His name was Timothy, and he wrote two letters to him. And in 2 Timothy 2.1, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, strong in the grace, strong is in dunamo, and it's in the present imperative in the Greek, and it, and it means to be constantly and habitually endued, empowered, and invigorated by the grace that is in Jesus Christ. And he spoke to Timothy that way, and he said, Timothy, if you're going to make anything out of your life as a Christian and as your pastor, you've got to stand strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he spoke about the hope that we have in God. And he said, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, when a person goes to apply for a job, sometimes they ask about the benefits package. You know, are, are you going to have a retirement program for me? I mean, how many sick days will I get? Will you help with a, a scholarship if I work on something, some, some education that might help with my job? Well, what Paul is giving us here is our benefit package. And part of that benefit is that we can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And it gives us the access to God, to hope, and, 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 and the good relationship that we can have with God. Now, the, hope, the, the definition of hope and the meaning of hope has been diminished because people use it in a maybe-so relationship or a definition or a concept. 
and 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 hoping that the weather will be good. You know, we, we talked about the sunrise service and hoping we'll get to see the sunrise on that day. But hope is more than that. As I said last week, hope is the flower that blossoms on the stem of faith. And it's only as good as the object in which it's placed. And our biblical hope is a confident expectation of what is going to happen in the future because we know God is a God of integrity, that God has kept his promises, and we know the future is going to be good. Not maybe so, but certainly so because God himself has said so. Paul says we're to hope, we're to have a confident expectation of the glory of God. And when we turn our hearts and minds to that future day, when we're going to be in the presence of God's glory, we will rejoice with hope. In Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4, Paul wrote, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on thing ab- things above, not on earthly things. Now, hope is only as good as the object in which it's placed. So that's why Paul is telling these people at Colossae to set their hearts on things above because the things of the earth aren't going to help you and set your minds on the things above, not on the earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now that's not a maybe so thing. Paul didn't say if Christ appears, But he said, when Christ appears, it is a certainty, it's a promise that we can bank on, and and, and it is ours to claim. Now, I want you to notice, I'm going to read a verse here in a moment, the contrast between the glory of this frail world and the glory of God. Let me read out of 1 Peter 1, verses 22 through 25. You've been born anew, not from perishable, but from imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. When he spoke about all flesh is like grass, it, it withers, it burns up in a hot summer, it dries out in a drought. The flesh that he's talking about is a reference to anything that is not spiritual. And what he means is the greatest achievements of humanity are nothing when compared to the eternal glory of God. And and I would compare it this way. You pick a dandelion and then it's got that fuzzball on it and you go, and it just vanishes. And that is what the glory of the world is in comparison to the eternal glory we have with God. Focusing on the glory of God provides us with strength to face the tribulations of life. In Colossians 1, 9 uh, 9 through 12, Paul said, "We, We have not ceased praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may live worthily of the Lord and please him in all respects. Now let me pause right here. When it speaks about living worthily, it did not say if you are worthy. None of us are worthy. But it's worthily is an adverb, and it's the way that we live our lives. So that you may live your life worthily, live a life that is pleasing to God in all respects, bearing fruit in every good deed. This is how we live our life worthily. Paul's giving it to us. Bearing fruit, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for the display of all patience and steadfastness, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who is qualified to share uh, in the saints' inheritance in the light. Now, this focusing on God's glory and what God wants to do with us motivates us. It's a motivator even when times are tough, tough, when we have to face the problems of the world. Now, I want to point out something. Being strengthened with all power. That is the same word that I gave with the same language that I gave to you earlier about strength and power. And so Paul used it in one context earlier. He uses it here and now. And it's the idea that the strength and power comes from a word uh, dunamis. We, We would pronounce it dynamite. 
And it's the power of God. In Romans 1.16, uh, uh, Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God, the dunamis, the TNT, the explosives, uh, that, that gives us the power that we need to live a wonderful life. But when Paul spoke about enduring the tribulations, it was plural, not singular, tribulations. He said, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, our trials, our tribulations, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us. Why? Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given unto us. Now, Peter spoke about those tribulations in 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning, beginning in verse 8. <clears throat> and he was writing in the time when Nero was persecuting Christians. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, and that's a command the way it's written. Resist him standing firm in what? In the faith. In the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the faith, in the principles and precepts of God's word, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever Amen. In John 16, with this idea of tribulations and suffering, the words of Jesus speaking to his apostles, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. You see, when, we, when we're faced with trials, when we're faced with tribulations, we need to remember that our all-powerful, all-knowing, always-present God will give us the grace that we need to endure. God recognizes our trials. He emphasizes with our sufferings. He fortifies our faith and he energizes our hope. And this results in what Paul called perseverance. Hupomone, it's an interesting word. Hupo means under and mone is the word that we get the word abide. Jesus uh, said in John 15, for if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it will be done unto you. So it's the idea of, of, of abiding under pressure. And because we are trusting in God, because we're focused on, on, on his glory, we know that we're, his promises are steadfast and sure, and we've got his hope, we, we can bear up under the pressure. And Romans 8, 28 says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Now, there are a lot of things that happen in my life and have happened that I have no idea what they, why they've happened to me. But in the hard times, I've said, God, I believe you're still on your throne and I'm going to trust you because I believe that even this can be used for you to mold me and to shape me in the person that I need to be. And Paul says when we persevere, that perseverance, the next thing he says, produces character. And that's the idea that it means to be tested and to pass the test. Now, we talked about this a little bit in Sunday school when we talked about the refining of the ore and how the impurities would be removed with heat. And, and, uh, and I, uh, we spoke a little bit about I used to make knives. And when I would heat treat the knife, I would bring it up to a certain temperature, hold it at that temp temperature for a specified time, then I would quench it, and I used bear oil from a bear I'd, I'd gotten up in uh, Canada. I would quench it in that bear oil, and when it came out, I would remove, remove, would remove the slag, the impurities that had come out of the knife, polish it to a hind sheen, and it was hard, and it was sharp because of the process that it had gone through. It produced character. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 2, Paul says, now we make known to, you, known to you, brothers and sisters, the grace of God given to the churches of Macedonia, that during a severe ordeal of suffering, that's the tribulation, the trial, and the sufferings they experienced, the church of Macedonia, that during a severe ordeal of suffering, notice their character that it produced. They had abundant joy 
even though they were fighting with extreme poverty. Their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in the wealth of their generosity. And this was produced by them remaining faithful to God in hard times by focusing not on their circumstances but the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And the more we endure for Jesus, the more we become like Jesus. I mean, if you were to ask Abraham about his ordeal, he'd pout point to Mount Moriah and the change that it made in his life. If you'd ask Joseph about his ordeal, he would point to the lessons he learned while he was in prison. If you would ask Moses about the problems that he endured in the ordeal, he would talk about the lessons that he learned on the backside of the desert. If you were to ask the three Hebrew children about the ordeal they experienced, they'd say the fiery furnace fortified their faith. If you were to ask Daniel about the ordeal that he experienced, he would say being in the den of the lions overnight confirmed for me the power of prayer and God can take all different sorts of universes, uh, uh, problems throughout the universe and use them for our honor and our glory. And then Paul said, spoke about the love of God that is given unto us. This isn't a trickle. It's like Niagara Falls. You see, hope does not put us to shame, Paul says, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And the very moment we are saved, according to Ephesians 1.13, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And Paul said in Ephesians 3, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from, uh, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. And I pray that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power in your inner being through his, spirits, through his spirit and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you being rooted and firmly established in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints. What is the length and breadth and height and depth of God's love and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This is the heart of the message of the Apostle Paul when he spoke, focused on the faith and the grace and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Let's bow for prayer. Well, fathers, we come to you now. Dear God, I always marvel at your, at your goodness and your grace and your love. And as Paul said in Romans 8, 32, we ought to be praising you, Father, because you did not spare your own son, but you delivered him up for each and every one of us, and that through him you freely give us what we need. God, may we be people of the word and live it. And Father, may we wake up the woke crowd with the love of Christ and the hope that we have in him. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite you to stand with us at this time, whatever you need might be, to come for prayer or come to me and speak to me about your relationship with the Lord.